you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicole, and thank you for Greg for organizing this, and Matt, and thank you all for being here. It's kind of crazy to see how much excitement there is for this ambiguous and, and broad topics we call memory. Um, so I'm Will, uh, engineer at Langchain. One of the honors that I get uh, at Langchain is to work with a lot of our customers and users in building successful memory and context systems. Um, and so this set of slides is just a few takeaways, a few lessons that I've learned, um, or a few lessons that I've had reinforced over the past year about sort of what it takes in order to build a successful memory system. Um, and if you take nothing else from this, it's that it's really hard to make a general purpose one. They're best if they're focused on your specific application and to always look at your data and have an experimental approach. So first we're gonna roll it back. A little over a year ago, we launched our first memory server. Um, it was a server designed to take in interactions between a user and an agent or a chatbot, and it would extract derived uh, insights about users that you could then later use. Um, we launched LangFriend, which is this journaling app, a demo in order to show how to use it, and we had a bunch of enterprise design partners. Over the subsequent months, we worked really closely with these teams and learned that you know, first of all, memory is very hard um, and, and had a bunch of lessons that I'm going to try to share to you today um, that caused us to sort of rethink how we wanted to share a lot of these tooling and a lot of these approaches for memory. The first being that there's no really real one-size-fits-all memory solution. Um, and if you think about it for more than a few seconds, this, this kind of makes sense. Um, you know, memory that we call uh, touches on a lot of downstream jobs to be done or skills. Um, we need to be remembering facts, information, relationships, this deeply interconnected web of information that we need um, to know. And an agent also expects to know all this information in order to perform well. Um, but that's not all. It needs to remember all of that situated in a temporal context. It needs to have more like episodic memory um, in order to remember these experiences. And it also needs to be understanding and able to learn you know, procedures and new information in order to execute on particular tasks. Not all of these memory types are necessary for every application. Um, this is also non-exhaustive, um, but these are some of the different types of ways um, that we see people wanting to be learning new types of things in their application. Um, and another reinforcement of this is you can see the different types of things that people want to be learning in real applications. Uh, so Nicole mentioned ChatGPT uh, launched their updated memory implementation recently, um, and they really catered this around their particular UX and use case. They have assistant response preferences, so it can try to learn sort of your preferred way of it learning, uh, of responding to you uh, in general. It has some topics that it's trying to model out. It's got useful insights about the user uh, that may or may not be useful, depending on the context. It has summaries of recent conversations to sort of extend that conversational buffer into a sort of compressed representation so it has more temporal context there. And then it has a bunch of random interaction metadata that it considers to be relevant, depending on the use case. Um, Contrast that with something like an email assistant, where you really want to be focused on a particular task. You want to be focusing on the style and content that you're going to be putting into it. Whenever it's scheduling, you really need to know what you prefer, what you don't, where you're available, all that kind of stuff. Um, you need to be having a deep understanding of different sort of procedures. If someone is emailing you and reporting a security event, um, and you need to follow all of that versus uh, something where it's just trying to meet up for coffee. All of these things you can try to program ahead of time, but if you want your agent to be able to learn this, you might not get too far if you're just reaching her off the shelf with them. Uh, the second lesson is that you know, updates and invalidation are especially error prone. You know, it's one thing to extract what you think is particularly interesting about a uh, bit of a conversation or a, a document. You know, LLMs are good at summarizers. It's even harder to then synthesize that and connect that to all the existing knowledge and domain that you have in order to create a consistent world model that improves your prediction downstream. Um, and so a lot of this ends up being application specific. This reinforces our lesson too. Uh, we've released a couple of tools um, for this. There's things like Trust Call to help with like, updates so your LLMs aren't willy-nilly deleting things. Um, we've released some like, other tooling and example around it. But at the end of the day, a lot of this is about how you're presenting and mapping your memory context to the information architecture or the needs of your application. Um, lesson three is that it's part of a broader context system. Memory isn't just this one isolated thing where you're learning about the user preferences. This is a part of you know, the situation in which the agent finds itself, be that your code base, be that the um, you know, recent events the user's gone through, and other sorts of things. Um, and when we had originally built our memory server, 
we had really focused and leaned in onto what we could differentiate. But a lot of the people we worked with wanted to then integrate this with all the other existing predictions, preferences, and other data that they have for their model. And while you can synthesize this all at prediction time or retrieval time, um, it's hard to create a sort of coherent worldview over everything the user engages with or everything the agent engages with if you're not treating this more holistically. Uh, lesson four, and this is one thing that we already sort of believed, but we especially believe now is that memory is really software, not necessarily hardware. Um, we often have people come to us and talk about, oh, I need a graph DB, or I need a very particular instantiation of memory for this. When really it's backwards, you need to start from what you're trying to solve. And we sort of made this mistake in that we had a, a very particular memory server with a particular instance. We got great feedback on that. We found that it wasn't sufficiently flexible for people, um, depending on the deployment context. So all of these insights drove our creation of the like, SBK. And we organized that around three main principles. One is we wanted to support easy customization and experimentation. All of the actual extraction runs in the code that you define. Uh, we have a number of primitives to try to address some of these memory types that we've talked about before. Um, but we really want you to be taking ownership over the type of information how it's updated. We want to support flexible storage and organization of memories um, so you can sort of define what makes sense for you. And we aren't going to lock you into a particular like vector database or anything like that. You can swap it out. Um, and we want a flexible processing as well. A lot of people talk about different sort of you know, batch versus online, all these types of different ingestion methods. We want to make sure that we weren't really only speaking to one particular thing in this SDK. Um, so to go a little bit deeper on the first topic of customization and experimentation, we have some primitives that we included in the library um, for the memory types that we found that people often lean towards. So one is this learning of knowledge and facts. We have this background memory manager where you can really customize in terms of instructions, the steps that are um, taken, how to reconcile um, information. And all this is sort of orchestrated in your own code. Um, another way that we have it that's not shown here is we just have some simple tools. And you can be defining it with an agent and so as models get better, if you want to treat this as purely reasoning over things, you can be including that. Um, we have learning instructions, or code books, or however you'd like to call that, complex workflows. This is very similar to prompt optimization. It's typically not the whole prompt, um, but you have different sections of the prompt where you're going to have instructions that are custom to the user. Uh, and this is especially like data-driven, where you want to be going over batches of, of conversations, uh, extracting insights from them, looking at explicit user feedback, and then incorporating the, that all into updates that you can then measure. I think if you put all of this into a very generic graph and everything, you kind of lose out on a lot of the ability to elicit the proper responses that you want. If you want to look at things like tone, if you want to look at learning new capabilities, or looking at more complex multi-step interactions that you actually um, need your agent to be learning. Uh, and finally, there's also learning of episodes. This is probably the least supported in the, in, in the, the library. Um, but we let you define synthetic few shots to be extracted, and then you can incorporate it down. The second principle we wanted to support was about flexible storage and organization. Um, so we allow you to store it in pretty much any back end where you have a get and put method um, and a search method. And so we have all these integrations as well. Um, one thing as a tangent that we're kind of excited to test out a little bit more is this file system as a back end, or at least exposing a file system like API. Um, and the reason for that is a lot of these coding or a lot of these LLMs and these foundation model companies are really optimizing for software engineering. And so one hypothesis that we're testing out, um, and we'll get back on more results in a bit, is uh, that perhaps they'll be more lending them to um, managing memories as if it were a file system. Uh, and so you know, that, that's the flexibility of this uh, library allows you to be experimenting with a lot of these things as LLMs tend to lean into different directions over time. Um, you can organize the memories by user, agent, role, um, organization, and all those types of things. So you're not locked into a particular, like, only organizing things around a user. You can have agents learn things just for themselves and share it across. Uh, and this is all sort of orthogonal to the actual process of information processing. Um, and you can process how and when you like. We have some abstraction around being able to execute this on a deferred basis, so you can be batching all of this later on. If you have a really rapidly occurring interaction, you can have it actually processed in real time, or you can delay it so that there's deduplication of information. Um, and all this can be managed either through a local executor or um, online with uh, LineGraph platforms, so it can be scaled in a very horizontally scalable way. Um, and that concludes my talk. I guess here's a summary slide of all the things that I wanted to share. Again, if you take nothing else, it's that really no one size fits all, and you really want to start with what you hope to accomplish, what you hope your agents learn, and then work your way backwards to pick the right solution for you. Uh, you know, test things out but don't just 
be willing to offload all of this to one particular solution that claims to be a holy grail. Um, we've put Langmum SDK out there, encourage you to experiment on it, encourage you to give us feedback. Um, we're always looking to improve it. Um, but I think, yeah, we would encourage you to take ownership over that. So thank you.